Hey guys, it's Adam from LucidPixel, and today I want to talk about not a secret, but more um, something I've learned through experience, not only from drawing, but from other venues in my life that I find probably have one of the most profound impacts on who I am today and what I produce. It, it impacts the quality of my work. It, 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 it um, affects the consistency of my work. It affects all of the above. It's probably one of the one of the most valuable catalysts that I have in my life to keeping me productive and producing my best work. And it's ironically something I didn't learn directly in drawing. I actually learned this in dance. For years, I was I was big into dance. Never professionally to I was I never pursued it professionally like I do art, but. It was definitely a huge passion of mine and it continues to be to this day. And I originally started with swing dancing and then I got into jive rock and roll dancing. And then eventually that evolved into salsa dancing, which is more what I do nowadays. And I have been doing this for, for decades. And at the beginning, for the first while, I danced just out of pure joy. And I always had a lot of I always had a lot of passion for it. I was I always gave my all into dancing and stuff like that. But I would go out, I would dance, I would have fun, I would do my thing, and then at the end of the day I would go home, take a shower, and go to bed, right? And one day, myself and my partner, um, who at the time was just my partner, but has since become my my girlfriend and mother of my children, um, but um, we decided to join in this pro-am competition. Pro-am meaning pro professional amateur, right? Not solid. Pro professional means you teach, right? So pro-am meant you, it was at a more professional level, but you didn't do it as a profession, so to speak, right? So we decided to join this competition. And I'd never done a professional choreography at any point in my life. This is the first time for me. And uh, we found out about it about two months before the actual competition started. And the moment I knew that we had committed to doing something publicly, my entire attitude towards my towards dancing changed. I knew that I had to produce my best work. The music that we mixed, the soundtrack, the theme, the costumes, the movements, the choreographies, everything was we went over it every single day for at least one to two hours every single day for two months before we presented this three minute choreography. You take for granted how long it takes to slap together a tiny little three minute choreography. It's a huge amount of work. But the knowledge that we'd be in a club with hundreds of people watching, music playing, and we were gonna be competing against other dancers, forced me to do so many things right. It forced me to put my best foot forward. It forced me to commit to dancing on a regular basis. It forced me to create a theme and to, and to present my work, our work, of course, I'm, I'm just speaking for myself here, but to, pr to present our work in a way that was the most entertaining and offer the most value to our audience. We had an audience, people who were gonna wait, who were waiting to see this stuff. And that's what we did. And even at the day when we actually went and did the choreography, we had so many physical obstacles. We were dealing with pains and discomforts and injuries and all this kind of shit. We were in bad shape the day we gave that choreography, particularly my partner. She was in messed up shape that day, but we pulled it through. We came through for our audience and we won. It wasn't a huge competition. We weren't up against 600 people, but we did win. And whether we won or not, the, f the what we walked into this competition only months before it, just being beginners, being amateurs, or being passionate amateurs who enjoyed going out and dancing regularly, and we walked out of there solid. We walked out of there tight. We had refined our movements. We had refined our style. We had refined our presence. And when we got on the dance floor from that day forward and every competition we did or every show we did, we ended up joining a dance troupe, a professional dance troupe after that and doing a bunch of choreographies, like, you know, high level choreographies and stuff like that. We got stronger and 
presented ourselves stronger and tighter on that dance floor. It gave us presence on the dance floor because we forced ourselves to, because we put ourselves in a position where we were now obliged to do this. Now, I do exactly that with my artwork. I'm doing it right now. I'm producing a YouTube video for you. I'm drawing on camera. Now, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying, I don't stand alone in saying this. In fact, I've heard many artists. I've heard Carlo Ortiz say this. I've heard Ahmed al say this. I've heard many artists say this. It's difficult drawing on camera. When I'm drawing, I like to kind of zone out and bubble it, put myself into my own little bubble of concentration. And I do a lot of trial and error. Rarely do I just nail it on the first shot. In fact, I can't say I've ever nailed it on the first shot. I always have to try two or three different iterations. Try this sketch, try that, you know, get this kind of reference, get that run, change my reference, change the theme around, change my visual storytelling, change the, there's a lot that goes into producing a piece of artwork. In the end, just like my choreography, you see the finished three minute production, but you don't see the three months that led up to it. Well, art's the same way. It takes a lot of work to get to where I am with my artwork. And when I know that I have a camera, like I do right now, recording what I'm doing, that can throw me into a state of artist's block. But with that stress of producing this drawing for you comes an obligation, comes a, comes a standard that I have set for myself and one that I encourage you to set for yourself as well, that come hell or high water, I will not let my audience down. If I'm not qualified, to impress you, I will make myself qualified to impress you with the artwork because I'm freaking put my, putting myself out there. I'm, my reputation's on the line. It's like when you see a live choreography and somebody screws up, that screw up to any dancer listening to, to me right now, when you screw up on the dance floor after after rehearsing a dance show or perfor a live performance for a couple of months, that mistake is amplified 50 fold because you feel like you made a complete utter ass of yourself. And then of course you watch the video after you, after that and you realize, oh, okay, it wasn't that bad. Usually it's not that bad at all, but it amplifies it. When I put, when somebody's got a camera on me, if I'm doing a live drawing performance, you know, in front of an audience or something like that, it's a stressful place to be. And a lot of artists, I've heard a lot of these artists say, you know, I hope I don't screw this up. <laughs> I'm not used to nailing it on the first shot, but hopefully it will. You put that extra stress on yourself to produce your best work and it forces your brain into a point of hyper focus. It's doing it for me right now. Okay. And that is an incredibly valuable thing. As a teacher, I have students. I have a standard to teach at a certain level, at a certain quality, to offer value. Every single time I sit down with my students for two hours, two hours a week, every single time I sit down with them, I put my best foot forward. I will never walk into a class and say, all right, I guess today we're learning about anatomy. Yeah. No, that's not my attitude. I want them to walk away informed, inspired, invigorated. I've been doing this consistently since 2015 and I will never stop. They are making me push myself. My students make me push myself. You make me push myself. And that's the reason why over the years I haven't gotten sloppier. I refine myself, my YouTube videos, the audio quality, the video quality, the editing, the introduct, the intros, the music. I've added value because I feel like growing for you and offering you more value. And you reciprocate with your feedback and you reciprocate with your time and your energy. There's this feedback loop that we provide between each other. If I was just producing my own artwork in my own little dingy little dark closet, you know, with the door closed, I've known people that have done, I've known people, I know people that have done this for decades and they never get out with their work. They always stay in their own little bubble waiting for some magic moments to burst open the door and, and just shine their brilliant work all over everybody. And my advice to you guys is if you are in that position right now, you're doing it backwards. What you're doing, and I see so many artists do this, is you hold back from sharing yourself with the world out there because you're waiting for your artwork to reach that 
magic invisible quality that to hit that bar you don't even know what that bar is do you you don't even know how good your artwork needs to be but every single time you produce a piece of artwork you look at it and you think shit should i post that should i post that and then you go online and you look at art station i've spoken about art station in the past here check out this video actually no i'm not gonna put in i'm not gonna put a link because they're about to disable those on youtube i'll just post it at the end of the video but um uh, you go on ArtStation, you see these brilliant artworks and you go, uh, maybe not today, right? And it discourages you from sharing your work because, well, shit, people are going to laugh at my work if they see that first and then they look at mine. Nobody's going to pay any attention to me. And you know what? They probably won't. If you're a beginner, if you don't have that much experience, worst case scenario, worst case scenario, they're not gonna like it as much as the other guys. Yeah. Can you live with that? Can you live with the fact that that artist over there that did this gorgeous, you know, uh, this gorgeous Final Fantasy inspired fan art, gorgeous rendering a la Scott Robertson level of polish, holy smokes. Can you live with the fact that they got more attention than you did? Can you handle that? because that's your worst enemy. It's the fear that your artwork's not as good as theirs. And can I tell you something? I can name, I, I have a life, so I won't list them out, but I can name off the top of my head at least, at least 300 artists that can destroy me artistically. But that doesn't stop me. I've learned to live with it. I've learned to just embrace who I am, to know myself, to accept where I am at this particular point in my life, but put myself out there because that forces me into a position to produce my best work. One of my favorite quotes was from that movie with Keanu Reeves where he plays an alien. Let me know in the comments below. I always forget the name of that damn film and I'm too lazy to look it up. But it's the one where he plays an alien and there's this one scene where he's, he's talking with John Cleese. John Cleese is a professor, he's human. Keanu Reeves is, is not human. And you're working out a formula and uh, uh, he's trying to brainstorm this formula on a chalkboard and, Keanu Reeves comes and erases it and fixes his formula and John Cleese immediately recognizes that he can't be human to have that kind of knowledge, right? And Keanu Reeves in that scene asks him the question because Keanu Reeves' job in that film is to figure out whether or not humanity should be saved and why should I save it? And he asks John Cleese the, qu the question, why should I spare humanity? You've had so many chances to change, but you haven't. And John Cleese's answer pretty much summarizes exactly what I'm talking about today. He says, it's not until we're on the brink that true change happens. You can say this true for any smoker of 20, 25 years who gets a lung cancer scare or some, you know, some person who's put off breaking up with somebody because they live in a shitty abusive relationship until eventually that person crosses a line of no return, a point of no return, and that is what they need to get the hell out of that relationship and go running. We need to be on the brink sometimes. Being on the brink is a great place to be. When I put myself on the brink in front of that audience and risked Shame, which of course would never happen, even if I fell on my ass. People would forget it five seconds later, right? I'm not the center of everybody's universe, but for that three minutes, you feel like it. And you, for that two months, you plan to be the center of everybody's universe. It puts you on the brink and it forces you to think, think hard, be focused, do your best, don't waste anybody's time. And every time I produce a YouTube video, that's exactly the position I put myself into. And every single time I sit down in front with a student, I put myself in that position. I'm not going to I'm not going to feed my students with half-assed knowledge. I'm not going to provide my students with promises that won't happen. I want to provide my students with exactly what they came to me for to grow and reach that next level. And I won't let go until I help them reach that point. I can't otherwise I just rip them off and I can't stand the thought of doing that. So if a student comes up to me, which happens every day, and they ask me a question that I can't answer, I go online and we find out the answer together. But I'll never just say, oh, it's that and lead them down the wrong path because I have a standard and I value leading people down the right, in the right direction and not 
bullshitting my way through life. And when you go public, you can't bullshit yourself anymore. You have to put yourself out there. You have to reach that high bar, that high standard, and provide the best quality you can to your audience. But don't fear failure. I have failed on YouTube more times than I've probably succeeded. If you look at my earlier videos, and you can call them failures, but if you compare my new videos today, the audio quality and the video quality and the editing quality of my earliest videos, I leave them there. I could have deleted them. They're not serving me any purpose now, but I leave them there because every now and then I like to rem I like to send people back to my early videos to have a look at them and just have a look at how shitty the audio and video quality was and how inconsistent it was. One day I'm going with this visual theme and the next I'm doing that. And one day I'm talking about this and I was freaking all over the place. I keep them there to let you know that that's worst case scenario, the shittiest, equip shittiest equipment, and I can even let you know what my old equipment used to be, you'll laugh if you find out what kind of webcam uh, equipment with some gaming headset and I got some you know work lamps from the hardware store and I clamped them onto the side of my monitor and shine, you name it, doesn't matter. But I did it and through the process of doing it, your feedback to me helped me grow. And eventually I learned how to use a DSLR, I learned how to use a DSLR camera and I learned how to shoot video and I learned how to do professional lighting and I learned and all of these things fed my art and fed you. And it was a back and forth experience. I learned, I grow, you grow, you feed back to me. It's a feedback loop. None of this would happen if I was sitting there waiting for that magic painting to make me famous. It would never happen. And it never will happen as long as you continue to think that you can sit back and wait for the magic to happen. I've seen people in their 50s and 60s that still are still waiting for that magic. It's not going to happen. Start now. If you're 50 now, 55, 65, 75, and you haven't gotten out there, but you still have a desire to make a career out of your art, it's not too late. Do it, but get yourself out there and let that feedback guide you. But do pick the right environments because some environments are full of trolls and haters and people who are out just out there to make you feel like shit. And there's other environments out there where they're constructive and they're helpful and they're kind. Those are the type, types of environments you want to make yourself a part of, right? You don't want to go and, see, you know, you post your artwork on certain, uh, uh, certain art sites and they just laugh at you and tell you that this is a place for professionals to get your artwork off the channel. I've, I've dealt with those in the past and I've seen those in the past. And you just avoid those. If you walk away from feedback feeling like garbage, it means you're in the wrong place. It doesn't mean you're garbage. It means they're garbage. But if you find an environment where you post something and you get constructive feedback within moderation, then you're in the right place. You guys always provide me with amazing feedback. Confided, I'm not a controversial YouTuber, right? I'm not sitting there trying to rattle any cages, but you guys always provide, 99% of what you guys provide me with is always amazingly helpful stuff. And I love you to pieces. That's why I keep doing it. And you should get that same kind of feedback from your art community as well. So don't just, don't just give yourself to any troll out there. No, you want to give yourself out to the right place, but get yourself out there. Don't be afraid and don't wait to be the best artist in the world. That's never going to happen. I'm still waiting. I'm sure I'm about 600 years away from being the best artist that ever lived. I can live with that. Can you? I can live with the fact that this painting, this drawing you're looking at, is probably not the best thing you've ever seen. I can live with it. Can you? That's what I want to challenge with you with today. Okay? Now, if you're an introverted person, I love introverts. And half of my friends are the best introverts. And I think that being an introvert is an incredible quality. It's not a social handicap. So I'm not talking about introvert versus extrovert here. I'm talking about finding the right crowd to connect to, but getting out there and connecting with them and pro providing consistent quality artwork for an audience instead of just doing sloppy, lazy stuff for yourself that isn't going to get you anywhere. Okay. But that's not a hate. That's not a hit on introverts by any stretch, because I think that introverts are incredibly valuable and should not be changed. All right. So, as usual, <laughs> this Canadian knows how to shoot his mouth off for extended periods of time. Hopefully, it's helped to kind of realign your brain a little bit and get you out of your your little cocoon. Okay. 
And remember as well, of course, I have my behind the scenes every single Monday or art talks. You know what? I'll be completely honest with you. Art talks and behind the scenes are pretty much the same thing. So I think I'm just going to go back to art talk again. I think it's a little bit more uh, intuitive, but whatever the case might be. Every Monday, I produce videos just like this one. Sometimes there's art. I'm trying to produce more art, uh, sometimes not. And remember as well, I have on Thursdays, I have my art critique, my live art critique sessions for subscribers. So if you want your own artwork critiqued, um, you can check out the description below. All the information is there. And as well as my online art mentorship. So if you're interested in learning art and teaching me a few things in the process, then I welcome the opportunity. You can check out the description below as well. All right, so happy painting. I love you very dearly. Get out there and I'll see you next week. Take care.